Thank you. Good morning. I, uh, I was told uh, at some point that uh, when a guest speaker comes into a church to begin with, thank you for having me, it's really great to be here. That's actually the worst way to start because that's what everyone expects to hear. You're supposed to start with something a little different. So I've blown it already. But uh, just, just by way of introduction, um, I actually used to attend this church. Uh, I think the very first time I came to Fort Gary Mennonite Brethren Church was in 1984. Uh, so it's a couple of years ago. Um, and, uh, and my wife, Natalie, she grew up in this church. Uh, she still has family here. Uh, you know some of them. I'll, uh, I'll just let you talk later and try and figure that out. Some of you will know. Um, and we were members here when our son was born. Um, it's, it's a good place. It feels good to be back here. Um, and uh, when, when Natalie and I were here and, and we got married and I was standing up here and she walked up this aisle, um, that, was, uh, that was quite remarkable. So this place holds a lot of very special uh, feelings and special uh, emotions for me. So it is great to be here. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, Square One World Media. I know that some of you are well aware of Square One. Maybe some of you aren't as aware. I do have a, a table and some stuff, a whole display set up in that, uh, what do you call that place, that big long hallway? The West Wing. The West Wing. Ooh, that sounds good. Okay, visit the West Wing on your way out. <laughs> this, uh, this is great. Um, but there's, there's information there on all kinds of programs that we, that we do at Square One. Uh, we are uh, a Christ-centered, biblically-based uh, ministry, and we produce uh, media for television, for radio, and for all various internet platforms, uh, for kids and adults, all right across the board. We produce that media in seven different languages. Uh, Russian, Spanish, Ukrainian, English, Low German, Dari, and Arabic. Um, and we are uh, venturing just a wee wee little bit into Cree, and uh, we're also considering some foray into uh, French language and also Mandarin. So I don't know when and where that will all happen, but we are trying to be open to what God has for us and have... Uh, have that kind of uh, go as God leads it. But we send this media out and it goes literally right across the globe. There is not a single continent on this planet where our media cannot be accessed. We don't know of a lot of, um, a lot of uh, input from Antarctica, but I think it's there too. And so I want to share a, a brief video with you and... Uh, uh, just of some of the new things that are happening at Square One. It's a little bit of a longer video than I normally share, so uh, just bear with us. And uh, there's one part in there where, where it, it features me, and that's a little bit strange for me to stand up here and feature me. But, uh, uh, but anyway, I'll, I'll let it run. Please watch this and uh, see what some of the new things that are happening at Square One. My name is Grant Hepner, and I'm the production manager here at Square One, which means I get to work with all the teams that make things, and I'm behind the scenes as well. Hi, my name is Howard Jolly. I'm the executive director of Indigenous Alliance Churches of Canada, and I do a show on Square One called Piwitapman, which is completed with me in Cree. It's just all about uh, joining people and just having them share their stories and the listeners hearing the stories of people and being impacted by those stories. I'm Scott Coop. Uh, I'm the associate director here at Square One and I am the host of a weekly devotional called The Weekly Well. It's a, it's a, a, a devotional program. Uh, it's very short. It's the, the whole thing, three minutes probably in, in that range. I am Virginia Spence. I am the producer of A Courageous Heart. It is a 
video podcast that features uh, testimonies, stories, women in ministry, men in ministry. So to make a program at Square One, there's different ways we go about it, but typically it starts with somebody from the audience who knows how to communicate to their audience walking in the door here. And uh, then we do some brainstorming and try and figure out how can we move the audience from here to there? What's, what's a creative idea to do that? I, I wanted to try and do an online thing with myself with just a, you know, just a phone, phone camera. I didn't want to have a high, high end production, you know, uh, with it. Uh, I, just, I just wanted to try and, you know, see how this was going to go, just, just, just using a phone. But then I, I was encouraged to really try and get a good, good production, good, good video footage, good audio footage, in in uh, in that. So, so and then Square One just seemed to um, come come into, I guess, to my life. And at that time, the the, the leadership here at Square One um, uh, just talked with me and just gave me a thought of um, wanting to to do an online ministry through Square One. When, when it was first proposed that we should do something like this, it made a lot of sense to me because yes, I agree, uh, to be able to give back to those who have been so faithfully giving to us was, was a, a wonderful thing to do and I, I loved the idea. And, and so really that was, that was kind of the driving force behind why we wanted to do it in the first place. We just wanted, wanted it to be a, an easy way for people to access scripture and uh, begin to think about it and contemplate it and, and absorb it into their lives. I had basically tried for quite some time to figure out the process for a podcast and everything had fallen flat. There was um, no open doors for me. So finally I said, okay, Lord, like if that's not what your desire is for me, that's okay. And right in the midnight hour, which is when God just loves to work, um, my friend said to me, can you email these people and just kind of suggest, you know, what's on your heart? And I thought, okay, one more email, what's, you know, no problem. And I did. And you know what? The Lord just moved. It was so amazing. The idea and everything has come with uh, collaboration, obviously, and it's just kind of developed as we've shared our story. We've talked about our hopes and our dreams, and it's just a, a beautiful vision that's come to life. We do a pilot episode, and that pilot episode is usually quite a bit of work. It's like creating the recipe from scratch. And then we take a look at that pilot episode and say, hey, this worked. We need to do some more work on this. We do some adjustments. And then we come up with a plan that we agree on and say, hey, we can make a series going forward like this. Yeah, when, when we did the first program, I was, I was, I was kind of nervous. I wasn't used to, you know, sitting in a chair and not looking at an audience, you know, just, just a camera being there and just the audience, you know, trusting that there's an audience listening to you. But as, as we went along, I, I felt like it, it uh, I, I started to be more relaxed in, 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 the, in, the, in the hosting or in the doing of the program. Oh, the very first one especially, I was, I was a little on edge most of the day, to be honest with you. Um, and I think we recorded in the early afternoon. So I came into work in the morning and uh, my mind was just racing because I knew what I wanted to say and I had it down on paper. But of course, when you're in the camera, you're not just gonna sit there with a piece of paper and read it. Um, and so I'm madly trying to almost memorize what I'm trying to say or what I wanted to say. Um, and when we did the first take, I remember just feeling like, oh boy, that didn't come out anywhere near <laughs> what I wanted it to. And as I've you know, been in front of the camera more, uh, you become a little more accustomed to it and a little more comfortable with it. And so um, it's an ongoing process. I think I'm becoming more comfortable with, with being in front of the camera. I was very nervous. I was very conscious of how I looked. Um, there was comments like, oh, I hope I don't fall off the stool. There was just, you know, those little worries and things in your mind coming into a new scenario. Um, I wasn't really sure what to expect. But I was excited. 
it was kind of surreal, I guess, to be here for the first time. And um, because our dream way back was to have his story told. And that was actually uh, a sister in the Lord had said, you know what, it would be beautiful to have maybe a video or uh, to have Alan's story and how the ministry was started. And actually, you know, and, and we were thinking, oh, that's a big dream. That's kind of almost impossible. We weren't sure how it was going to happen. And to walk in that day and to see it unfold, it was, it was powerful. It was the Lord saying, I hear you. I believe the world needs to know that God loves them individually. We want them just to be encouraged. You, you speak into people's lives. We just got to really uh, uh, believe that uh, God is there and, and God is giving opportunity for us to, to spread the good news. I would really encourage people to watch other people at work ask questions. I think that helps you to overcome any fear because it takes the pressure off. So a little bit of a, a window into what goes on at Square One and a couple of our newer programs that we are starting. Before I continue on and jump into Daniel, I just want to make one more uh, mention of something. Our executive director, Shwai Bebadi, said to me, he said, make sure to say hello to all the people at Fort Gary. Uh, Schweib was a member here before he and his wife moved to Ottawa. And uh, so Schweib works remotely from there with some connections that we have in Southern Ontario. And uh, yeah, so he and I meet uh, a couple of times a week over Zoom. So, um, so it's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing, but we are a media organization after all makes sense that we would know how to do those sorts of things. Um, I want to jump into uh, Daniel chapter 2, carrying on with the sermon series that you, uh, that you have begun here. Um, and I recognize that, that there's, a, there's a little bit of a difficulty in, in how do I take what I do at square one in this video we've just seen and then make that make sense with Daniel in this case and what we're talking about. And I'm, I'm realizing that maybe uh, I would be kind of forcing something if I tried to make a connection. I think there are connections here, but I don't want to force anything. So we're going to let square one thing and all that you've heard just kind of stand on its own, and we're going to let Daniel stand on his own here. So a little, uh, little overview, as Ruth already mentioned. King Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2, he has this dream. And, and he wants an interpretation. He wants, you know, how, what does this mean? What's the deal with this dream? But he gives a very difficult task to his, to his uh, people there to say, I don't want to tell you the dream and then you tell me what it means. I want you to tell me what the dream was. So think about that for a moment, right? Your kid has a bad dream, right, if you're a parent. Your kid has a bad dream. They wake up, they come to your bed. I had a bad dream. Well, what was this bad dream? No, well, you tell me what it was, and then you tell me, you, you know, reassure me kind of thing. I can't tell you what it is, right? He's, he's giving them an impossible task, and they say it. Times were different then, obviously. But here he says, no, no, if you can't tell me what it was, you're going to be executed. I mean, this is, this is fairly, it's a big deal. And I can't imagine what was going through the minds of these, these magicians or whatever they were called, enchanters. Oh, boy, tell them what it means. Well, or tell them what it was. We don't know. So the word goes out, and everybody is about to be, you know, there's going to be some mass, mass executions going on. And Daniel, of course, gets wind of this. And he says, no, no. He said, uh, he said I can, uh, we, we can do something about this. And so it's there where I want to pick up this idea of faithfulness in exile, and particularly Daniel's faithfulness in four specific areas. And the first one is Daniel is faithful in prayer. 
and I think prayer is the place we need to start. If you look throughout scripture, every kind of big move of God always began with prayer. Almost always. Um, so Daniel hears the problem. That's the first thing. The king has had this dream. He's not telling them what the dream is. They have to tell him what the dream is and then interpret it. I, I, I can't really... Where do you start with that? Where do you begin? Do you just make something up and hope you're right? It could be anything, right? You can't do that. Daniel hears the problem. And there is a problem. But Daniel is faithful in prayer. And so the next thing that Daniel does is he actually he gathers his community. He's got these friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Some of you may be recognized, if I would say better, as Rakshak and Benny. Um, <clears throat> uh, if I would say Hananiah, Mishael, and uh, what's the... Uh, I can't remember. It starts with an A. Anyway... It doesn't matter because you don't know those names either, right? Uh, it's very interesting that they are known by their um, Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Daniel's known by his Jewish name, by his Israeli name, as opposed to Belteshazzar. Regardless, he gathers his community, right? This is really, really important, this gathering of community. And I think it's, it's so good, as I have been involved in, in churches and gone to a number of churches uh, talking about Square One and, and preaching, we've, we've come out of this whole COVID thing, and maybe that's a bad word to say, I'm sorry. Uh, but I think we are coming out of this. I wouldn't say we're coming out unscathed. But what I am seeing is we've got churches that are more and more and more looking a little bit full. And that's really good to see, because I think the gathering of community is an important thing. The gathering of community is important. When we are separated and segregated and out on our own, we can go off the rails fairly easily. There's something about the gathered community that is beneficial for us in our own spiritual lives. And Daniel seems to recognize this, because the first thing he does is he gathers his community. And then <clears throat> Daniel prays for God's mercy. Which makes sense because when you think of it, he's praying what? God, tell me what this guy dreamt. Because I, I have nothing to go on. I have absolutely nothing to go on. At square one, we have people that go out and do ministry and and often it feels like they are completely out on their own and there's nothing there and their reliance on God is key. It has to, it, we have to rely on what God can do. If we're simply relying on our own effort, that's not good enough. And we pray for God to be merciful. We pray for God to open up hearts of people. We pray for God to show us what we need to do and what we need to say. And by his Holy Spirit, amazingly so, he does that. So Daniel prays for God's mercy. Then there's faithful in trust. The next area where Daniel is faithful. Two things. The first thing is Daniel trusts his friends. I don't know about you, but I have, I have some friends that I, can, I know for a fact I can trust them with anything. I can tell them anything. I can ask them anything. And I can trust them with it. I have other friends, maybe the more correct term would be acquaintances. Well... We're friends, we get along, we hang out occasionally, but I'm not quite sure I would trust them with the really deep or difficult stuff. Is that anyone else's experience here? You know this, right? Yeah. We've got one guy that relates to me here. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's good. Or one guy who's brave enough to say it. All right. But he trusts, Daniel trusts his friends. You see, he has... He knows that these aren't just his friends. These are his, this is his community. This is his spiritual 
uh, backbone in some sense. They're with him, and so he trusts his friends. But then he also trusts God, because after hearing the problem, after gathering his community, and after praying for God's mercy, talking then to his friends about it and says, pray along with me, it's not written specifically in there, but what Daniel does is he goes to bed. He trusts God. He goes to bed. And it's during the night that God reveals this stuff to him. I don't know if you're one to be prone to worry and just stay up all night when something is troubling you. But when we give something to God, when we give our request to God and we say, God, I can't do this, you have to handle it, and then we refuse to really fully let go of it and we still wrestle with it continually all night long and we don't go to sleep, it's like, I wonder if God ever says, do you not actually trust me with this? You can't do it, but I can. Relax, go to sleep, you're going to need your rest for what I've got planned for you. Daniel trusts in God. Think about this. He trusts in God to the point that he hands it over and then he goes to bed and he leaves it with God. And then this is the next area of faithfulness for Daniel. I think this is really, really important for us to recognize. Daniel is faithful in praise and thanks. When I was a kid, my mom always hammered it into me, don't forget your please and thank you. Um, and it made sense. I think most parents do that with their kids. Um, we attempted to do that with ours. I think we did okay. We would hear things back about how amazing our kids were and how well behaved they were when they were out or this place or that. And Natalie and I sort of scratched our heads at some points. It's like, wow, they should be more like that at home. I've, I've got good kids, I really do. Um, besides which, they're both married and they're out on their own. So, uh, you know, we did the best we could and it, uh, now at this point, there's not a lot more we can do. No, they're good, but, but I think, I used, to, I used to comfort myself with the fact that, well, maybe they're just kind of rotten at home at times is because they know it's safe there. They know we love them regardless, right? They can be horrible at home, and we're still going to love them, and they knew it. Um, but faithful in praise and thanks, Daniel praises God's wisdom and power. The God who can reveal mysteries, the God who can do things that we cannot. Basically, Daniel says thank you. He is faithful in it. God wants our praise. And in fact, that's why we're gathered here this morning, yes? God wants our praise. And God is pleased when he hears our praise of him, our thanks to him for all he has done. And especially, I think, when we gather corporately to do that, God is thrilled with that. Daniel is faithful in doing that. So he praises God's wisdom and power. He praises also God's revelation of mysteries. Because let's face it, how in the world is Daniel going to know this dream? How is he going to know it unless God reveals it to him? Because Nebuchadnezzar is saying nothing. He's pretty tight-lipped at this point. I don't know whether the king simply wants to get rid of some people, and this is a good way to do it. I'm not sure. I don't think so. He throws out this unreasonable request. But Daniel knows what God is capable of doing. Daniel knows. Do you face something in your life ever that you just throw up your hands in the air and it's like, I don't know what to do. I have no answer. I have no reference point for this. I don't know what I'm going to do. Has anyone ever experienced that at all? Same guy. <laughs> You're bold. I love that, man. That's good. I have. Where I'm, I'm just sort of, I've got nothing. I don't know what to do. I don't know what's going on. 
And I pray and God can show me things that I never knew were even possible. God can lead me in ways that I never dreamed I would go. And then after D Daniel's praise of God for wisdom, power, for his revelation of mysteries, then he thanks God for wisdom and strength. And it's interesting because in some ways, God, Daniel is thanking God here for wisdom and for strength, and he hasn't yet really done anything. But he knows that he has it. Years ago, when I was a youth pastor and we, we led a mission trip, someone was missing something. She, this girl had lost her medication, and, and she needed it. This was not just... You know, well, it would be nice if she had it. No, it was 100% necessary for her to have it. The only way she wouldn't need this medication is if God somehow just miraculously healed her in that moment. But she needed it, and she had lost it. And she came to a few of us and said, can you pray that I find this? Like, I've lost it. I don't know what to do. And I went up to her, and I said, you know what? I don't want you to worry. Um... God knows where it is. We're going to find it. We're going to find it tonight. And I turned around and went back to my group. We were going to, be, we were going to start praying on, the, you know, on this mission trip. I was back with my group. And as I'm walking back, I'm thinking, what in the world, Coop? What have you just promised this girl? Why would you say such a thing? I don't know where those words, well, I do know where those words came from. But it was just so strange to have them exiting my mouth. And I, you know. We came back and I, I told the story to my, to my group that I was with and, and they started to pray. And I could not have been more pleased with this group of young people, high school age young people. Someone mentioned on the video that they taught, they taught them more than, you know what I mean? The, the young people teach you more than you teach them. This group of young high school age kids started to pray and they prayed and they prayed and I don't know that I've ever heard more faithful praying in my life because they were, they were praying, thank you, thank you, thank you. They were thanking God that he knew where it was. They were thanking God that that, that medication was going to be found. They were thanking God that we were going to find it tonight. And I was like, wow, you guys are bold. You are praying expectantly, and it's brilliant. As we lifted our heads after our session of praying, someone kind of got my attention. They said, Scott, they, they, I turned around and looked, and here was, here was this girl. And I went to the, to the window. We were in Mexico, and so I went. She, there was no, no glass in the window. The window was just literally a hole in the building. I went there. She was on one side. I was on the other. And as I, as I approached and got near, she held up the box of this medication that she had lost. God answered the prayer before we were done praying it. It was just a real lesson to me about praying expectantly and thanking God for what, not only what he has done, but thank God for what he is about to do and trust him that he can. Last piece where Daniel is faithful. He is faithful in action. This is, I think, the hardest part, right, of faithfulness. We can, we can pray. We can trust or at least make it look like we are. And we can even praise God and give thanks to him. But when it comes to the action, it's where the rubber hits the road and we actually have to do something. So Daniel, after praying, after believing, after thanking God, he goes and he presents himself to the king. This could not have been... A very, um, a very easy task for him to do. I don't know what was in Daniel's head at that point, whether the dream had already been revealed to him or whether it was getting revealed to him as he's going. I don't know. We're not told. But he presents himself to the king. He tells the king the dream, which is correct. He tells the king what it means. And then what happens? Nebuchadnezzar recognizes the power of God, right? 
He praises God. The last bit of faithfulness in action, Daniel's reward comes. I don't know if we always necessarily get to see the, the reward of faithfulness. But in this case, Daniel does. And he's promoted, he's made like a powerful man in Babylon in charge of things. His reward comes. Now, I want to be careful. I don't want to preach simply just a prosperity gospel because I'm not sure I agree with it. In fact, I know I don't agree with it. Faithfulness doesn't mean that you will suddenly get rewarded and you will suddenly be rich and you will have an easy life because that doesn't make sense. It doesn't line up for me with, with what Jesus dealt with. If Jesus dealt with difficulty and persecution and suffering, why would I assume that I should be exempt? I don't think Daniel was exempt from it either. You have to read the whole book of Daniel to see the picture. But reward does come. Faithfulness does get rewarded, if not in this life, in the life to come. And I think that we need to live our lives with a mindset of not only the here and now, but also what is to come. We can't live our lives so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good, but we also can't live our lives so much invested here that we don't recognize that there's something else beyond this. We have to hold them both. So what about us? What about us? Are we faithful in prayer? Are we faithful in trust, in praise and thanks? And are we faithful in action? Your story of, of faithfulness and mine may look quite different one from the other. But one thing is for certain, we have a model here in Daniel about what faithfulness looks like in some very key areas of our life. I want to close with one story. It's from our Spanish department at Square One. And our, our Spanish uh, director, his name is Heriberto. Heriberto was, uh, he is the new host of Encuentro, which is a program, it's Spanish, Encuentro means encounter. It's an encounter with God. And it airs very regularly and, and people all over Latin America listen to this. It's actually listened to on more than 1800 radio stations. Um, in the Latin American world, radio is kind of the biggest place to, to get word out. And yes, you heard that right, not 18 radio stations, 1,800 radio stations. Someone had called in and said she was struggling. She was struggling. She, uh, she had been abused sexually by a family member, unfortunately. And after that happened, to make matters worse, in the same week she had made an error or a mistake at her job and she had been fired. So she had had quite the week. She was at her wit's end. She said she was, could, she's never been more discouraged. She said she knows about, about church and about God and about Jesus, but she's never given her life to Jesus. But she listens to Encuentro regularly. Heriberto talked with her, asked her if there was something he could do. And after a conversation, seeing where the Holy Spirit was leading this, he asked her if she would like to accept Jesus. She said yes. And she did. For the first time in her life, she was a child of God. Through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. She listens to Encrentro still regularly. She calls in weekly, actually, for encouragement and support. You see, she demonstrated a faithfulness because when she knew what she needed to do, she called. When she was presented with the gospel, she accepted it. 
Heriberto was also faithful. He's not the hero here, by the way. He's simply faithful. Are we faithful to what God has called us to do in the circumstances that he has called us in? I pray that God would find us faithful, absolutely faithful, in whatever the circumstances are in your life. And may we be used by the Lord to point others to him as the source of salvation. Amen.